the big difference between uh, the powerlifting approach to lifting and I'll say the CrossFit approach to lifting is that powerlifting is a lot more, let's say, ritualistic. It's a lot more methodical. It's a lot slower. We take a lot more time, both literally and figuratively, because we're only doing three lifts. The nature of these sports are very different. Obviously, in CrossFit, we're trying to do a bunch of different things uh, really well, but also do them very quickly. In powerlifting, you can really kind of focus and slow down. And so a lot of what I coach and a lot of what we as athletes try to do is create one singular way to do the movement. That's the same way every single time. That's from the empty bar all the way up to your top set or your top whatever set. All the reps should be exactly the same. So I always tell people to respect the empty bar. I've seen people get injured, you know, throw their knee out on an empty bar squat. If you stop paying attention for one moment, then things can go very quickly south. Also, when you're in a state of high stress or a foreign environment, like at a meet, for example, your body's gonna default to whatever it's done the most often. If you've only done reps one particular way, and it's the right way, then if you get distracted by somebody screaming or a bar falling or something else like that, your body's gonna hopefully go back to doing what it knows, what it's done, and even if you get distracted, your focus will automatically shift back into the appropriate movement pattern for the um, effort. Yes? Do powerlifters ever front squat? Do you ever throw that in like when you're in your training routine? I will give somebody a front squat as an accessory, primarily to improve their speed off the floor for conventional deadlifts. So most of the initial pull for deadlift comes from the quads, and so if we get better at this, then that initial pull off the floor is going to be a little bit better. But I don't give somebody a front squat for the sake of doing front squat or to get better at front squat. I don't care if they do it like this. Most of my people can't do it like this, myself included. Uh, so it's really just as a way to target the quads. To that degree, I would also do like hack squats. Are you guys familiar with hack squats? So there's a few different ways you can do it. Um, I don't wanna get too far off the track here, but using a kettlebell behind and your heels elevated on something, like three or four inches, straight down, and then right back up. If it seems easy, it's because you're leaning on it and using your hips. So this will blow up your quads, and then again, it will give you some of that speed and that pop right off of the floor for conventional deadlift. Sumo is a very different story. We might get to that today. But um, does that answer your question? Okay. okay. So um, let's see, where was I? Um, oh yeah, so kind of make the reps the same way every single time. And so the approach I'm gonna take with you guys as far as teaching these movements is to just approach every lift and talk about the things that are going through my head and the things that I would coach somebody to think about as they put together this one singular lift. Some of these things are not gonna be practical for the CrossFit environment, and that's okay. It's just gonna be more information that you have, just a different way of doing things. Primarily what I'm getting at is we rest a lot. Right? If you have 20 minutes to get to a one rep max, it's just not gonna happen if you do it you know, the power lifting uh, way, which is okay. But by understanding the different ways that we might approach this from a different angle, you can hopefully coach it a little bit better and just you know, broaden your uh, knowledge base as well. So, any other questions before we jump in? Okie doke. So, back squat. The first thing that I do when I look at this bar, you don't have a center middle on any of these bars, but powerlifting bars do so they don't slide down your back. I like to focus in on that center row. Yeah, does anybody here remember magic eye? Yeah. The thing that you like put up to your face and then it, you like move it away. <coughs> anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So I like to stare at that knurling like it's a magic eye because it gives me this tunnel vision and everything else kind of fades away to black. You need a tremendous amount of focus to do one thing very, very well in a very particular exact way. So for me, that focus comes from initially just staring into this neuron for probably about a thousand. And I know it seems weird, but there's a checklist that I want you guys to be thinking about in your head that you're gonna run through for every single iteration of this lift. In order to do that, you're gonna need a tremendous amount of focus. If you've had a bad day at work, or you had a bad workout, or you just got off of a bad phone call, if you're still thinking about that, then you're not going to be able to run through that checklist effectively. So you need some grounding agent. Okay, for me, I stare at that center neural. Some people like to stare at somebody in the audience, at me. 
Some people like to stare at their feet. Their shoelaces is one that I've heard of a lot. Some people like to visualize tying their shoelaces without actually doing it. I thought that was an interesting one. Anyway, the idea here, here is to find focus, find a state of calm so that you can start to run through your ritual of how you're gonna do this way, okay? Next thing I'm gonna do after I find my focus is place my hands on the bar in a very, very calculated way. So I'm gonna use these lines and these marks to put my hands exactly where I want them. As far as how wide you go, depends on shoulder mobility for the most part. It, it does work more for me. <laughs> Overachiever here, Dolan. Um, so my hands are also going to change position intraset. So my shoulders are really tight in the beginning of the, uh, of the session. By the time I get to the end, I'm going to move my hands in by about four inches. So that's why this really long, drawn-out <laughs> warm-up process, like. <laughs> Sign of age or? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it just is what it is. Like, in a 20 minute strength portion, I'm, I'm going to be maybe just ready to start doing real squats. Right? And, and that's just a reality. I'm also working up to a much higher number, but you know, these are some of the things to consider. So, anyway, um, I put my hands right here to start, and then I do do a low bar squat. Okay? So, is everybody here familiar with what a low bar squat is versus a high bar squat? Yes. Just go over it. Okay, so yeah. we're going to go over it. So I like to use the actual structure on the back towards your neck to find the positions for your different squats. You need a demo person so you can point while someone's doing it? Actually, it's better if you can see me doing it. Okay. So um, we've got this bone at the base of our neck. Everybody does. It's a little bit higher or a little bit lower for some people. So your high bar position, I like to start above that bone. So I can really feel it, how uncomfortable it is when that bar is on it. And then when it slots into that spot right below that bone, in between the shoulder blades and that bone at the neck, there's your high bar position. It may be higher or lower depending on your particular structure and your anatomy. For me, it's right about there. Should be on a bone, just have a nice little slot there. The low bar position, the next landmark on our back are our shoulder blades. So there's that bone right there, those two. As soon as it rolls over that, it's gonna slot right in on my rear delts there. You'll see right there. That's my low bar position. It's not down here because I saw somebody else doing it that way. <laughs> it's different for everybody. So some people will have what looks like a kind of in-betweener position where it's not quite high bar, not quite low bar, and they're like, I don't know, it just kind of fits there. Yeah, that's just how you're built back then. Everybody's different. Some people have this bar like six inches lower down their back, and they can hold it there. Fair enough. There's no one size fits all. That's why I like to use the structure of the back to help somebody find exactly where that bar should be resting for each position. If you can get away with a super low bar position, and that's just where your delts kind of slot, lucky you. Right? Like, I was born to deadlift. I have long arms, long legs, short femurs, short torso. If you can get that bar lower on your back, and that's the way that you popped out, use it. Okay? So, once I find that position on my back, I'm going to come all the way underneath. I'm never going to unwrap the bar from back here. Okay, I don't want to do a good morning <laughs> to unwrap 500 pounds. So I bring my feet in line with the rack, and then I swing my knees forward. And this is for a low bar squat too, guys. It's not just a high bar squat. I'm going to get super vertical. I'm going to get all the way underneath it, bring my knees drastically forward so that my torso is just about underneath the bar, and then pop it up. Okay, from here, I take the exact same three steps every time. One, two, three, and an adjustment. I practice this walkout all the time. One, two, three, and an adjustment. The same way every single time. I never do any of this. Okay. I'm never unwrapping it directly into my walkout. I'm taking the time to pop it up, 
looking down where I'm stepping the same way every single time. Any questions so far? Okay, so once I have this bar. You got a question? Oh. Um, I don't know if you are going to talk about it, but since we've already talked about walking out, mm -hmm. I figured. Anyway, your wrist. So I noticed you had like an overhand grip and you made sure that your wrists were straight versus like sometimes you see people kind of grip it and they're. Or bent. So, do you have any tips for like how we make sure people can keep their wrist or wrist wrist straight? So, I I don't really care about wrists okay. that much, to be honest. I care more about what the forearms and then the rest of your arms are doing as far as externally rotating on the bar. So, when we talk about lat activation, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, but I, the wrist position is not something I really focus on. A lot of the time it's just dictated by how mobile the particular athlete's wrists are. Um, overhand grip is fine. I like to wrap my thumbs around it, generally speaking. I think when I was demoing, I just had them like this just because that wasn't the focus. But when I actually lift, I wrap my thumbs around. Find that slot, and this is how I do it. So I don't, I guess they're kind of straight. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty straight, so I didn't know if that was like, Intentional or not really. I, mean, I think I think if you're squatting the right way, then it generally speaking will end up looking like that. But again, everybody's different. Okay. You know, if that position and the length of your um, arms is such that you can't get into the right lat activated uh, torso position without bending at the wrist, then bend at the wrist. Whatever works. Okay. So uh, after I unlock the bar. I've taken my steps. One, two, three. I like to get comfortable here. Now this is partially because in a competition scenario, you have to wait for a squat command. So you can't just walk out and then do your thing and then you're done with it. You have to wait here with your knees locked, your hips locked, showing full control. And then a judge in front of you is gonna say squat, okay? After that, I'm gonna take my breath. And the breath is maybe the most important part of this entire endeavor. Let me go grab my belt. If you have a belt, grab it. Don't have a belt. You can use your hands on your belly. going to set up your support and stabilization for your entire torso. And the belt is a really big part of that equation. And I know the belt is a controversial topic for some people. I'm not going <laughs> to point anybody out, but some people really don't like belts. But here are my thoughts on the belt. Okay. The first and foremost <clears throat> benefit of the belt is it gives you some physical feedback about where you're breathing. Because most people don't breathe into the right place. <coughs> Excuse me. It's water. You have water, dude? That'd be great. Um, <coughs> most people are gonna breathe up into their chest and their shoulders. So before they squat, and then if they're wearing a belt, they're gonna then push their belly out to try to create pressure against the belt. And that's, you know, those are good intentions. You know, most of the time, people don't even push their belly. They just take a big breath, and now there's actually less space in here. The belt is actually looser. It's not doing anything. Okay, when you breathe, you have to breathe into your diaphragm, into your belly. You have to think about inflating a balloon down here. When I breathe, go ahead and come up here for a moment, would you? Go ahead and put your hand right in here. Okay? So. Most people breathe like this. In case you can feel how tight that is. Yeah. You should breathe like this. Big difference, right? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, exactly. So, 
Somebody's hand should get stuck in here. By virtue of your breath alone. Not you pushing your belly out, but literally just when I breathe, all the air and all the pressure is going down into here. It's creating this outward pressure that's then, because of the belt, being applied unilaterally, equidistantly around my entire torso. Now, without a belt, it's very hard for most people to feel that. Even me. The body awareness is just not there without the belt. I know if I'm breathing the right way because I can feel the belt get tighter around my abdomen. Before I deadlift in particular, I'm going to set up and I'm going to kind of try out a few breaths first. I'm not just going to take the first one that comes along. When I feel like I've got a really good one, I'm going to hold that one and then I'm going to continue. Okay, so that's the first big reason that I like the belt, is because of the feedback, the ability for you to make sure that you're breathing the right way. The next one, the obvious one, is it helps you lift more weight. Okay, so if you know how to breathe the right way using your diaphragm, and you, by association, know how to use the belt, then it will help you lift more weight. Okay, some people might argue, well, shouldn't I not use the belt so that I have to use my core and it's going to strengthen that more and this and that? Well, maybe. That's one argument. But to that I would say, you know, I'll give you a little story. A lot of people in my line of work come into the gym and they're like, Rob, I want to squat four weights. 405 pounds. Okay? You ever had 400 pounds in your back? Yeah. It's really, really heavy. So yeah, heavy. only once this morning, but. So, you know, my question there is always, do you have the infrastructure to even support that load? Let's forget about moving the load. Can you even support it? And if you're lifting more weight more frequently, even if you're getting a little bit of help on your midline, you're still exposing your CNS, your skeletal system, your tendons, your ligaments, all your primary movers to higher loads. That's how you get stronger. Yes? So would you have somebody like brand new start out with a belt? Or is there like a, a milestone that you would wait until they like got concept of squatting and deadlifting and everything without a belt first, like is there a, a time frame, like a body weight squat, body weight deadlift, like sort of like milestone that you wait until they get a belt for, like is there any sort of like golden rule, unwritten rule of like when to use a belt, when, to, when somebody's like graduated enough to like, okay, if you're starting to lift everything, you can have a belt now. Like is there a, is there a time frame? Right. That's a good question. There is no time frame. I like to get somebody on a belt as soon as humanly possible. This is part of where the format of these two disciplines and sports is very different because I'm usually working with people in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. Right. So I can take the time, like when I take on a new coaching client, the first thing that we do is talk about breathing. And if we're gonna talk about breathing, then we're talking about the belt. <coughs> because like I mentioned, the first thing, the best thing about the belt is it gives you that feedback. So I'm gonna teach somebody both how to breathe and then by association, how to use the belt the right way from the very, very beginning. You will do your lifts differently wearing a belt than you would otherwise. Okay, there are things that happen, right, because this thing is here. Like, it's going to hit me right here. It's going to change the way that I squat just a little bit. And like I mentioned before, as far as creating a ritual and a repeatable pattern, I want every single rep to be the same every single time. So, empty bar squat, maybe I won't, you know, close my belt, but I'm going to already have it off. I'm going to start to build that same pattern the same squat that I do every single time because it has the belt. I wear knee sleeves too. We don't have to talk about that, but you know, knee sleeves I like, they just offer a little bit more stability. Again, things that help you lift more weight are how you get stronger. If you're not measuring your strength on one of these big strength lifts, then I guess that's a different discussion, but most people are gonna measure, well, how strong am I on one of these big compound lifts? And if you're lifting more weight on these compound lifts more often, you're gonna get stronger. At least at those lifts. Does that make sense? Okay, so. Um, hold on. So I know you used to own a CrossFit gym. Yes. So when you your athletes like did squats and deadlifts and stuff, did you encourage them to wear a belt? Or because you know, because it's CrossFit and you, you know it's different than with powerlifting, you have a big group of people. How do you ensure everyone is 
breathing and getting feedback from the belt versus like using it as a crutch. Right. You know, so well, that's a great question. Suggestion. Uh, in a class setting, I never really push the belt uh, as like a universal thing. I would go up to people individually. I guess kind of to your point, Delaney, like what's the point <laughs> where you have somebody use a belt? When I've seen that they understand how to breathe. So I used to do things in warm up before squatting or deadlifting day, like um, lay on the ground on your back and have your partner drop a med ball on your stomach. And if you breathe into your diaphragm and you inflate that balloon, the ball will bounce off of you and it's not a problem. If you hear somebody gasp, they didn't breathe the right way. Okay, it's very simple. I don't know, maybe it's crazy, but that one seemed to work. Uh, like it. Pretty well for me. Um, I used to also have people do, as part of their warm up, uh, crocodile breathing. Are you guys familiar with that? So you come down on the floor, put your hands like this, and then you just breathe into your belly. I don't really know why this makes it so much easier to find your diaphragm, but everybody can breathe into their belly when they're down here like this. Because they get the feedback of pushing them against the floor. This is not for 530 What's that? You, they get the feedback from pushing against the floor. Right, exactly. Which is just like the belt. Not unlike the belt. Makes sense. What tips do you have then for coaching an athlete that is struggling with this and they're not getting the feedback that they need? Because we see that too, or we see people that just completely tighten it past the point that they right. can take a full breath. I would tell them to make it looser. Uh, I mean, I Science! <laughs> yeah, I mean, so uh, I guess, you know, in all seriousness, I, I, I probably would have a conversation with them about it. I mean, I think it's our job as coaches, if we see something, to say something. Now, again, in a class environment and, you know, with people being sensitive, there's uh, a delicate touch that you can use. Some people, I'm sure we have all kind of these people, will say, yeah, yeah, sure, and then just not care what you said. And that's fine, that's certainly their prerogative. All we can do is um, advise. My coach told me that one time, he's like, hey look man, you wanna go off script? That's fine, I'm just here to advise. I'm like, I like it. So, I don't know if that really answers your question, but you know, if you see somebody that's tightening it down too much, the first thing that I would do would be like, hey, have you ever tried it a little bit looser and really focusing on building pressure through your belly first? Like, just as a coach, I like to ask people if they've already tried something first instead of making an assumption that they don't know or that uh, they're doing it wrong. Like, there may be a reason. You know, like, oh, like, you know, I, um, I'm recovering from a hernia. So I'm not really into building the intra-abdominal pressure right now. In that scenario, I would say, okay. I'm not sure you do that right now. <laughs> In that scenario, I would say, okay, why don't we take the bells off then so that you don't get a false sense of security moving through these patterns. But, yeah, in, in general, people don't know how to breathe, and they don't know how to use a belt. But if you can take the time and you can figure out a way to get them to do both of those, their lifts will immediately improve. Um, one thing that I think also helps with that, that I asked somebody the other day, was um, show me how fat you are. That's been my cue that I took from Louis Simmons, was literally show me how fat you are, like breathe into your stomach. And that has been working pretty well with getting people to brace in the correct way, whether they have a belt or not. So if it's braced too tight and they can't like breathe out against it, like you can't show me how fight you are to loosen a little bit. So that one I think has been working really well. So was that a question or? No, I was helping. I was also answering. Um, but that's a cue that I use that I feel like helps in the bracing and the yeah, just, people who are doing it wrong. I just feel sort of like thing. when you go into a CrossFit gym, the, there's a misperception that the belt needs to be as tight as the belt can possibly go. But that's, <laughs> that's where you see injuries because people about, I don't understand the breathing core. Right. Now, I mean, I don't want to get too nuanced with it, but if, if you're using one of these like Velcro fabric belts, <laughs> crank it down tight because it's not really going to do much. Right. Because like, they don't sort of expand and yeah. Right. Like, they're not as tight. They're not tight like that. You guys, you got to pass yeah. this belt around. This is a powerlifting belt. It does not move. Remember, you took it out of I still have it. Yeah. Or a yeah, a it's level. So when you breathe against this thing, 
right? When you, when you breathe against this, you get Delaney's hand stuck in between your waist and your belt. It doesn't expand, and so with this, you want to go looser. Absolutely. Um, but to your point, I think most people use the belt as a crutch because, oh, my back has been sore. Like, this is the most dangerous thing. Like, oh, my back has been sore, so I'm wearing this belt, and I'm wearing it extra tight for extra protection. Like, it's not support. It's not support. That's oh, not how it that's works. not how any of this works, right. So, yeah, like, you gotta nip those things in the bud straight away. I would rather see somebody not using a belt and continuing to focus on their breathing uh, rather than using a belt before they're ready. And it's just up to us as coaches to have that foresight and to be able to make that determination. Fortunately, it looks like most people at this gym seem to frequent the same classes, so they're getting more or less the same coaches a lot of the time. So you can develop those relationships and you get to know your athletes, obviously, and um, you can advise them on how to use the belt, how to breathe and whatnot. But, you know, when I had my CrossFit gym, I would start every lifting day by talking about breathing. And I would always have something in the warm-up that had to do with you figuring out how to breathe, right? Whether it's the medicine ball thing, sometimes I had them like throw the medicine ball right up their stomach or drop it, um, you know, stuff like that. Just a physical understanding of, yes, this is right, I'm not wrong. And <laughs> it only takes getting that ball dropped on you the wrong way for you to figure it out miraculously. It's funny how that works. All right, so any other questions before we move on? Okay, so moving back to my ritual. I've stared in the mirror like I found my focus. And I'm gonna push the bar. Set my hands up very, very carefully. Find my position. Make sure it's perfect. There's no rushing, okay? If it's not perfect, I'm gonna start over. There's never any question about it. I'm never gonna unrack a bar if it's not in the exact right position, if my hands are not in the exact right position. Again, it could be different if you're doing like back squat and a neck con, fair enough, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay, so the exact same way, or I'm walking away. Pop it up. One, two, three. Now from here, I'm gonna do two things. The first one we just talked about, the breath, I'm gonna take that breath. I'm gonna squeeze it. The next thing I'm gonna do is activate my lungs. You guys see that? The difference between this and this. So, along with the breathing, lat activation is gonna be a recurring theme across all three of these lifts. Each of them is about how we can find the right breath and how we can activate our lats in order to support our torso through the range of motion. Uh, of motion. The way that I do that on this bar is to pull it down and then bring my elbows forward into external rotation. Okay, when I do that, sometimes I cue squeeze a softball in between your armpits. Okay, this thing right here, squeeze that and hold it there. If you're up here, you're not going to find it. If you're forward, you're not going to find it. Your shoulders have to be back, and your shoulders have to be down. Back and down. There's a crossover symmetry in here, right? Somewhere? Yeah. Somewhere. So I like to use crossover symmetry with people to teach them how to do this. Probably one of the hardest ones is the one that's like a face pull or a row. How do you get your shoulders and your elbows to be up without doing this? Okay. Shoulders down, shoulders back. You can go through a range of motion like that. Then you'll understand how to find your lats on all three of these lifts. Okay. Like this. So most people are going to want to do this. All right, the traps. Shoulders back, shoulders down, like that instead. Okay, even higher. It's really hard to do, but we don't want to be up here. We want to be here. People don't fail these lifts because their primary movers aren't strong enough. I'm sure you guys have all seen somebody at a regular gym doing like 20 plates per side on leg press. 
okay, who probably couldn't squat 300 pounds. So this is very common. Part of it is they don't have the technical aptitude on the squat pattern, okay, fair enough, whatever. But most of it is because they don't have the core control and the torso stability to take that load through a range of motion. So if you can find extra stability, you're gonna be able to unlock more of the power you have in your movers and get it up into the implement. Otherwise, it's like, you know, punching a hole in a hose. All the water pressure is not gonna to get to the other end. It's gonna start popping out in the way. It's like you're back rounding and stuff like that. So activating the lats by bringing your shoulders down and back, cranking your elbows forward, finding these wings and holding them the entire time is gonna make it so you can push as hard as you possibly can through your legs and hopefully get all of that movement and that power up into the implement. When you see people that are really experienced that lift day fail, the reps are perfect, okay? They stay right in the slot, okay? Inexperienced lifters, when they fail, we find out where their breaking point is. I'll tell you, it takes at least five years, usually closer to 10, for somebody to fail all of their reps perfectly. Almost everybody, when you take them to a one rep max, you're gonna see where they break, where their deficiencies are. It's a really useful thing to know, actually, as a coach. But that's also how you can tell somebody's training age. If they fail ugly, you know, barring some injury or something, intra rep, then they're probably a little bit younger. Not literally, but you know, in their training age. Right, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> if you see somebody fail a rep and they're not sandbagging it, they're just, you know, there's like steam coming out of their eyeballs, and, but they're still in the slot, you can tell this person's been lifting for a very long time. And they've got all that infrastructure and that technique built up from years and years and years of repetition. So, so in that case, is it just that their movers need to be stronger? Like, it's not a lat activation issue, it's not a breathing issue, it's... So what you'll see very lats. commonly in this sport is the people at the top throughout their career will go up in weight classes. At a certain point, you're so good at the movement and your muscles are as strong as they're gonna be at a particular weight. The only thing you can do to keep making progress, really, is get bigger. So, now it takes a very long time to get there to that point where like, I've literally used everything that this body and this brain can, can handle. Very few people get there, but the best in the world almost always go up in weight class for that very reason. Good question. All right, so, almost done with squat. My ritual, focusing on early, pushing my belt on. One, two. One, two, three. Cue the breath, find the lats. Then I exhale. I'm holding my breath the entire time. I am not a fan of exhaling on the way up. Some people swear by it. They're like, well, I do like a martial arts like type of thing. I'm like, you know what's gonna happen if you're under a grinder? How long can you do this? <laughs> really? No, that's not gonna work. You're gonna run out of air and your balloon is gonna be deflated. That thing that we've just spent so much time talking about, find it, it's gonna be gone. That might work for like a quick thing. I might do that in the neck con. Fair enough, you know, because I need to keep my air going a little bit quicker anyway. But if this is my thing, I'm holding my breath the entire time. There's no exception. Agreed? Okay. So let's also talk about adrenaline management. Okay. So part of the reason that I come all the way underneath here and pop it up is so that it feels like 
Obviously, if it feels lighter, I'm using less energy. I don't want to be doing a squat or a good morning before I do my squat. Yes, Dave. Is this like the standing up with authority thing? Like standing up and kind of like let it bounce a little bit? Is that? I don't ever want the bar bouncing on my back. Does, does that make sense? But yes, but it, it's that same line of thought. Okay. It's, I want to own this weight, I want to feel confident on it. If you unwrap a bar and it feels heavy, <laughs> And then you're, and then you still have to walk it out, and then somebody's gonna want you to go down and up with it. Like, it doesn't seem like a good idea anymore. It, your brain is like, should we be doing this? I don't think <laughs> and so when that happens, here's what happens. A lot of times when people are, are moving away that they're uncomfortable with, they go down real slow. Almost turn it into like a tempo pause squat, and then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because. You think you're doing the right thing by going, you know, slower and more control and more stable, but really you're just burning your candle down more and more and more. A little experiment you can do to this end is like, take a bar with 50% or even less of your one rep max, unrack it, and then see how long you can hold it on your back. Okay? At first it's going to feel really light, and then after a little while you're going to be like, does this work? Does this actually work? Right, you're, you're isometrically supporting this load on your back. It's work. Every second that this thing is still on your back is work. And that's work and that's energy that you're not able to apply to the actual lift. Now, the very important distinction here is to not rush. You want to take your time on your setup to make sure that everything is perfect. That's where it makes sense to spend the time. But you don't want to spend time going down slowly, or pausing, or coming back up slowly. That's why you need to be confident when you unrack that bar. And this is the same thing for bench press and for deadlift. Um, in powerlifting, in a meet, can you like go down, can you back hold one? Can you, can you get stepped in and you can bounce down? Absolutely not. I didn't know how rules. Okay. Yeah, so in powerlifting, you can only go down and then up. You can definitely bounce, but, I mean, you can even stop. But if you go down again, right. you can't double dip. Okay. Only back up. So back to adrenal management. Sometimes. Some of you, that's what smelling salts are for. Some of you have seen me squat, <laughs> and you'll notice that I do a thing like this. Oh, okay. okay? If you get like a little rush in your head, you get some adrenaline going, and then you get under that bar, you pop it up, it's going to feel like a and if it feels like nothing, you're gonna step it out, you're gonna feel good about it, and you're not gonna do this tentative thing. You're gonna attack the hall, get your bounce, and then hopefully come back up again. Setting yourself up before you do the lift, arguably more important than the lift itself. That's why all these details and these elements of the ritual are so important. Make it the same way every time. If I don't do that, then the weight's gonna feel heavier. And if the weight feels heavier, then the next time I try to hit that weight or a similar one, it's gonna be in the back of my head, heavy. I don't want that thought in my head. I wanna think, yeah, doesn't look too bad. Easy, yes. Is this the same thing with not maxing out but multiple reps? Uh, same adrenaline setup for like a set of five or a set of 10? Good question. So there is a limited amount of adrenaline you can't just live your life from smelling salt to scream back to smelling salt. So, me personally, I save those for the reps that I'm concerned about uh, feeling heavy on my back. Because again, the whole point, not only is it gonna give you that extra power, that extra confidence, but it is mostly about just making the weight feel lighter when you're on racket so that you don't go slower to a hole with a heavy weight. So if it's a weight that I'm not concerned about that happening with, I'm not gonna waste the adrenaline. Now, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but I'll, I'll give you like a little idea of how a meet goes for me. I prioritize deadlifts, because it's my best lift. So I will have, in the previous week to the meet, not had any caffeine, maybe like a half cup of coffee per day, just to not get a migraine. And then I'm gonna have one cup of coffee before I squat. And the most that I would do would be like that. And I'll probably do that in my third attempt. 
we get free attempts. Um, I'm not going to use too much of my adrenaline on squat or on bench. Yes? What's, what's too fast and what's too slow? Like, how do you know control? Like, we're obviously paying more attention to one rep max right. than one rep in a mouth. But what's too fast of a descent or what's too slow of a descent? Gotcha. Because I'm sure I fall into that category. Let me circle back to that in like 30 seconds. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much of my energy and adrenaline on squat. I want to save it for deadlift. So before deadlift, remember I've had no caffeine for a week. I'll take 600 milligrams of caffeine, four Advil, 10 grams of creatine, eat a bag of gummy bears, put on my music, and then I'll tell my handler, I'll see you on the other side. Okay? <laughs> my handler. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. There are, there are handlers. So anyway, um, the idea here is that I'm going to get such a rush. There's going to be so much adrenaline. The only thing I want to do in the entire world is pick something really heavy up off the mat. And so particularly out of meat, but even just in training, managing your adrenaline is a really big part of how you express your strength against these things. So if I'm not in a meet and I'm just doing regular training, I'll do that maybe for like a couple reps my top ones. It's not going to be a full blowout for every single rep. But, you know, for the top ones, definitely, I want it to feel light, I want to be confident about it. Now, what's too fast going into a hole? At the point where you lose stability. So the way that we can see that somebody's losing stability, invariably, is when their bar path is not, or rather their bar speed is not linear. So if somebody kind of like, falls into the hole at the bottom, which we see a lot with high bar squat. It's different. In high bar squat, you a lot of times want to use that balance and not slip into the hole. You're a lot more upright, so you can get away with it. You can use your quads to kind of spring out. A low bar squat, you're going to be more leaned over. So we don't want to slip in, get a butt wink, and then come back up. So you want to go down as fast as you can while being mostly linear and under full control. So generally, you're going to need to see from the side a video to know whether or not your pelvis is tucking at the bottom, whether or not you're slipping down instead of keeping that speed linear. Now, some people do low bar squat, and they do slip in the bottom of the hole, and then they come back up, and that's fine. That's their style. But generally speaking, I like to see a fast but linear speed that shows that you're in full control and then you get that bounce and you come back up. Then that's your push up. Uh, let's see. What else about squat? So we've gone over the entire movement. Um, what other questions do you guys have about low bar squat? When you're low bar squat, Absolutely. So at a meet, there are spotters. You have five spotters if you're lifting over 500 pounds. So there's going to be one person over here, one person over here, one person behind you, and then there are going to be two additional people, one at this angle and one at that angle, to grab onto the plates. So somebody will grab onto the bar, somebody will grab the plates on either side, and then somebody behind you as well. Um, because we don't do competitions using a power rack. Which is stupid if you ask me, but it is what it is. So absolutely spotters. And I would say for a high bar squat, also use a spotter. Like you don't need a spotter till you need a spotter. So low likelihood of injury, but extremely high risk and high cost of it. You know, again, I've seen people throw their knee out on an empty bar. I'm sure we all know people that have thrown their back out just rolling out of bed, just doing something innocuous. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> So I'm a, I'm a big fan of having spotters always, also because it helps with that confidence. Right? Like if you're, if you're walking out 500 pounds and you're just in no man's land and you've never squatted that before and it feels heavy, shit. Like 
I don't want to do that. I'm not going to be amped up to like try. I'm going to be really tentative, real skittish, and then I'm going to give up way sooner than I would have. If I know that all I have to do is keep pushing, and if I start going back down, somebody will catch it, I'm going to keep pushing. Assuming I've managed my adrenaline and I actually want to be doing this thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that over Days where you make people train without their belt and train without their lifters and train without this just to like prepare for that? Or no. I never do that. Nice. That's just me as a coach. I mean, if you don't have all your stuff on meet day, you've made a big mistake. And I mean, hopefully, like your training will allow you to do the best job that you can given the circumstances, but you fucked up. Like that's end of end of the day. You know, think of it uh, of it this way, like major league pitchers don't just like throw with the other arm. Right. Just to like, you know, well, well what if, like, well, no, if this thing goes, then I'm screwed. Like, that's, <laughs> that's it. Like, if I don't have my knee sleeves and my belt, like, I'm gonna bring my numbers down. I'm not gonna squat as much. End of story. Yeah, just a little. Sometimes it's different in CrossFit. Like, if you're like, always squatting lifters, but like, the workout has like, heavy squats in it, but you also can't do the other movements in lifters, right? right. So like, I think CrossFit's a little bit different in that aspect of like, Absolutely. Having, and you know, the only time that I would really low bar squat in CrossFit outside of like a strength portion would be if it's like a back squat from the floor, like a 135, something that I can get on my shoulders and then wiggle down into low bar, I might still do that. But for the most part, it's gonna be high bar. And yeah, to your point, I'm probably gonna be wearing manos. But if you've been focusing on the fundamentals, how to breathe, how to brace, how to find your lats, how to go down into the hole with a linear controlled speed. All that stuff is universal. This stuff just gives you a little bit of reassurance and some feedback that you're on the right track. But if you take those things away and you've been practicing getting on the right track for years, months, whatever, then hopefully you're still getting on the right track. Do you have athletes that you coach for like just their body reasons, like high bar, or do you make it, do you, does everybody do low bar? And Great question. Bar? So yes, I think your anatomy dictates which type of squat you're gonna be best suited for. So for example, if you have a very long torso, low bar squat and conventional deadlift for that matter are gonna feel really, really bad for you. Same thing if you have really long femurs. So you know, if you have long femurs, yes, it's gonna more naturally put you in a more bent over position. So low bar squat could maybe feel a little bit more comfortable at lower weights. But when the weight gets to a certain point, the leverage disadvantage you have of being pushed so far back in a space by this long femur or this long torso is gonna start to make it just impossible for you to get back up. You're gonna start trying to do a good morning with a really heavy load. So same thing with Olympic lifting shoes. If you have an issue with leaning over too much, then a lifter can help you be a little more upright. So sometimes I'll see people that are low bar squatting in a lifter which, you know, offhand doesn't make too much sense, but if they have longish femurs or a longish torso, then that could be just what they need to get a little bit more upright to support this position. Still get a lot of the benefits of low bar. Does everybody know what like, the benefits and differences are between low bar and high bar? I'll, I'll just go over those really quick. So, you know, high bar squat in that position is gonna be a lot more anteriorly loaded, so much more quad, more hip flexor, more upright. The low bar squat's gonna pitch you forward a bit more, and as a result, it's gonna use more of your posterior chain, so your glutes, and your hamstrings, and your back, but it's also effectively shortening the lever of your back, which kind of makes it stronger. All right, like think about trying to jack up a car. If that pole is really long, it's easy to jack up the car. If the pole is really short, it gets a lot harder. So shorter becomes harder to torque the other end. So we don't want to torque down here. So the shorter this lever is, the stronger it's going to be. But yeah, so if somebody has long femurs or a really long torso, I'm going to probably have a high bar squat. Like you don't really see a lot of Olympic lifters that are built, you know, uh, like me, <laughs> for example, right? Most of them are going to have, I mean, I've got the short femurs, so that's a good thing. A lot of them are going to have longer torsos, right? Generally speaking, short arms, 
bit of a longer torso so that you know, they can be a lot more upright and really enjoy and feel comfortable in that position. Tremendous ankle mobility, a bunch of other things as well, but you know, people are not all uh, put on this earth to do everything. When I got my USA weightlifting cert, the guy, he's like from Texas, he's like, let me tell you something. Not every one of you was made to be a weightlifter. I'm like, yep, I believe you. Answer your question. Yeah, so like looking at like Emily here, like, She's a good example of like, what would you tell her to do? Well, I'm she's got, yeah, she's well so, like, so let's do this. So he's, he's now going over 